Next, we are going to hear from Omid Safi. Omid is an award-winning scholar of Rumi and the Sufi path of radical love. He is a professor of Islamic studies at Duke University, who's been nominated for Professor of the Year 10 times. His Memories of Muhammad is a biography of the Prophet Muhammad. His most recent book is Radical Love, Teachings from the Islamic Mystical Tradition. His next two books are forthcoming from Princeton and Yale on Rumi and the Sufi Sage, and I, I'm gonna ask you to help me with this. Karakani. Yes, Karakani. Omid's, Omid's podcast is Sufi Heart. His illuminated tours have taken 1,200 friends from over 20 countries to Turkey, Morocco, and Omrah. He teaches online courses on Rumi and Sufism through illuminated courses. Omid. Good morning, friends. Good morning. Assalamu alaikum. May the, may the peace of God enfold you. Uh, I would love, love, <laughs> to stand with you today and to talk about joy and serenity, love, compassion, and mercy. That's what I know. That's what I've spent the last 40 years of my life devoted to. Um, I wrote a book, <laughs> Radical Love, going back about 1,400 years of these teachings of love. Uh, we're taught in my tradition to have our heart be where our feet are, that we're called to tap into the timeless, and also be timely. So I'm asking myself that question of what does love have to say today? You all are watching the same news that I am. What guidance does this love have to offer us? What does love have to teach us at a time of war and conflict and bombing. But this is not gonna be all a downer, I promise. <laughs> so we're gonna start by a story from that difficult to pronounce Sufi sage, Kharaqani, this illiterate shepherd. And he tells a wonderful story of these two brothers one of whom he calls the praying brother. He spends morning, noon, and night in prayer to God. And the other one spends morning, noon, and night taking care of their mother, their older, sick, vulnerable mother. He does the basic prayers. He does the minimum. But his time is devoted to, Mama, can I get you some water? Mama, can I help you stand up and go to the bathroom? Mama, do you need something to eat? So the two brothers have slightly different paths. And then one night, the praying brother gets the thing that all of us hope for. He has a dream of God. He hears the voice of God coming to him and saying, congratulations. For the sake of your brother, I have decided to forgive all of your sins, both of your sins, and admit you to my present presence. And the praying brother says, oh my God, I have been waiting for this my whole life. But you see, my dear beloved Lord, I think you're mistaken. I think what you meant to say, oh God, is that for my sake, for the sake of all of my prayers, all of my devotions, you have decided to forgive both of us, because you see, I'm the praying brother. <laughs> um, and Kharagani ends that story by sort of a mic drop moment in which God responds, no, no, I'm pretty clear <laughs> about whom I'm speaking with. You see, all of those prayers that you did 
for me, I have no need of. But your mama needs you. That's the end of the story. No moralizing. Your mama needs you. Who needs us today? Right. Um, I have been haunted. I'm a Baba. I'm a father of five children. Uh, I make a point. I do not show bloody bodies and things like that. People deserve the dignity even in their death. But this is one of the lucky ones who has survived. And they have an acronym for them now, which we did not have before, WCNSF, Wounded Child, No Surviving Family. Every single person who has ever loved this child has been killed. What does love have to say to them? We know history and politics, and there's a time for that. As a being of love, what do we have to say to children like this? Just so your hearts are not so shattered, we can start from music from the 80s. If I say, what is love? You say, Baby, don't hurt me. <laughs> That's the starting point. What is love? Baby, don't hurt me. Right? We're going to get to the love of God. We're going to get to ecstatic, mystical love. Can we begin with, baby, don't hurt me. Don't bomb me. Don't deprive me of food. Don't take my land. And then we can do better. We are fortunate to have prophets and prophetesses, sages, Buddhas, and illuminated teachers. When our beloved prophet ascends to God and has this face-to-face -face encounter with Allah, which is really the model for us for everything that we do, God gives him a choice, and it's the same choice that the bodhisattvas have been given. You can stay in this state of bliss for as long as you wish. He's too respectful of God to say yes or no. The only thing that he can mutter is people, humanity, creation. I cannot stay in bliss until every last soul has an opportunity to ascend. That's what we're called to in, in this way. I want us to talk a little bit about Rumi, this beautiful beacon of love. He lived in an age, if it's possible, even more difficult than ours. 10% of the world's population was wiped out at a time that he lived. And yet he stands up and he says, I know you're tired. I know you are hurt. Come, this is the way. If he says, if you have lost heart in the path of love, flee to me without delay. He reminds us that love is not a feeling. Love is not a sentiment. As I tell my teenager, love is not an emoji, right? <laughs> you don't text love. You do love. You live love. You embody it. And ultimately, it's not our love. It is God's love. Because God is love. It is love that brought us here. It is love that sustains us here. And it is this cosmic river that is erupting out of God. And if we can just, for one breath, get over our own fine self and merge into this river of love, 
it's going to carry us back home. But this river has to be like sunshine, has to fall on everyone and everything, has to be like air. The air that we breathe in this room is the air that all the trees and all the plants and all the animals breathe. We are connected together, and this love cannot be allowed to stay tribal, national. Rumi says at one point again, you and I should live as if you and I never heard of a you and an I. You and I should live as if you and I never heard of a you and an I. I want to end with a little reminder. Uh, every year, I have a chance to take people to these sacred places where Muslims, Jews, and Christians, and people of all faith and no faith have had a good history of living together, not always perfectly. We go to Rumi Shrine, and a few years ago when we were there, this wonderful woman, an American woman who lives in Morocco, a good friend of my dear friend, Gray Henry, her name is Nora, an American Muslim. We're standing there, and she works in a Moroccan NGO where they serve vulnerable women, at-risk women women who've been abused, women who've been abandoned, divorced. And she said something as we're standing right there in front of Rumi's tomb, and she says, Omid, everything you say about love and radical love is so beautiful and is true. This need to rise above our own ego, propel ourselves out of love into care for somebody else, it's all true. This need to remind yourself that you're not the Pharaoh and you're not God. So soften the ego, humble the ego. But you see, I spend all of my time working with women who've been told their whole life that they're already a nothing and a nobody. So what does the path of love have to say to people who've been told their whole life that they're a nothing and a nobody? And how can I tell them, come and get closer to God by being more nothing and more of a nobody? No, maybe the thing that we have to offer them is to look at them through love and to say, you're somebody. And to some you are their everything, that you are precious in the sight of God, and that your life has worth and meaning and beauty. I've taken up the time that I had. I'm going to abuse my privilege for one more minute <laughs> and maybe never be invited back. <laughs> this is one of the great female saints of my tradition, born a Christian, enslaved for a while, and she um, becomes a great Muslim mystic. Her name is Rabia. In the way that we remember her, it's that she's running through town with a lit torch on one hand and a bucket of water or vase in the other hand, the juxtaposition of opposites. It's a weird image. And people are like, Rabia, what you doing? And she's like, I'm going to find heaven, and I'm going to burn it down. I'm going to find hell. If you're Southern, you know that hell has three syllables. <laughs> hell. I grew up speaking Persian, I learned English, and then I figured out, oh, I also have to learn Southern. It's a whole, <laughs> it's a whole other thing. I'm going to quench the fires of hail so that people have no reason left to worship God 
other than God. Right? And she says, my Lord, if I worship you out of fear of hell, burn me in it. If I worship you out of this transactional thing of trying to get into heaven, make it forbidden to me. But if I worship you only for your own sake, do not withhold from me your everlasting beauty. And the story from her that I'm ending with is there's one day she's walking, there's a preacher on a pulpit, preaching at a mosque or a church or a temple, and he's repeating the Gospels, right? Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Ask, and it shall be granted unto you. Rabia sticks her head in. And she's like, what did you say? This preacher is annoyed that this woman has interrupted his beautiful speech. And it goes, woman, I said, <laughs> knock, and it shall be opened unto you. And Rabia says, fool. The door was never closed. Mm -hmm. Rumi grows up on this and he says, sweetheart, you have been knocking and knocking and knocking at the door of God. My beloved, you're knocking from the inside. You're already within. You're already home. Let's figure out what love has to say when you're already inside of God. Thank you, Omi. And uh, I really appreciated the uh, instruction on how to say Hayola. Hail. 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 Um, yeah. This is, it was lovely. And you spoke at the beginning about being timeless and timely at the same time. Um, and love is certainly timeless and timely, but so are darker forces, hate, conflict, the same. Um, what hope do you have? I mean, and if you look at any of the holy books, that's the struggle. In, whoops, my comb fell out of my hair. Anyway, um, that's the struggle in all the books. What hope do you have that, that it's not going to be such a struggle forever? Is there a way for permanent change, for, for people to transform? Forever is God's business. We are children of the now. Uh, in every breath, I am responsible for the tiny bit that I can do mm -hmm. to alleviate somebody else's suffering and to bring a slight ray of love and goodness into mm -hmm. this world. I know it will not always be like this because God is a beautiful God and God is a good God. And in, injustice cannot last forever just as the darkness of the night cannot last forever. Um, and we see this, all of our scriptures have accounts of people behaving horribly. Because we also need to know how to respond to something like that. As we keep remembering that the world is not divided between good people and bad people, but that these are struggles inside every single one of us. The stories we read in scriptures are mirrors so that we can figure out that we are the followers of the prophets and we are the infidels. Now, some of us are doing a much better job of embodying certain aspects of what we kind of see. Um, I come back to this notion that we're in this together. Either we go up together and we get to a place of learning to live in beauty with one another or we all go down together. We haven't figured out so far how to live on any other planet. More planets out there, more galaxies out there than their grains of sand. This is the one home we've got. 
And if we mess this one up, there is no plan B. So we're not going to, we can bomb bodies into pieces, but we cannot bomb our way into peace. Peace is not a destination, it is the path. And we've got to figure out what does love in action look like now, and then the ones who will come later, and God herself, himself, can take care of eternity. Thank you. And I think it's time for our interlude.